Mushrooms have always intrigued me since I was a kid. I would often draw them, draw on them in the case of conchs, collect them, and take spore prints. And my eighth grade teacher, Mr. Alicio, really helped stoke my curiosity into the fascinating realm of fungi, to the point that I thought I would study mycology when I was older. Fungi are integral to our lives, as the world's best decomposers, as medicine makers, as food, and as subterranean messengers, many of which help shuttle much-needed nutrients to a myriad of plants that inhabit terra firma. So when one of our friends had suggested that we would really enjoy visiting the Cornell University Plant Pathology Herbarium, which colloquially we've been calling the Mushroom Museum, we were intrigued. Now we've already paid a visit to the Liberty Hyde Bailey Hortorium and Herbarium in the area, so we were curious to see what would exactly be contained in a museum of mushrooms. We were delighted to find that the place was a true wunderkammen of mycological mysteries carried forward over many generations. We toured the exhibit and had some really good laughs along the way with curator Teresa Aturiaga and faculty director Kathy Hodge. All right, we had to travel a little ways, but we are here at uh, what we call the Mushroom Museum. But what is the official name of this place? It's officially the Cornell Plant Pathology Herbarium. Okay, not as uh, sexy But I like as the Mushroom Museum. Yeah, it's not as sexy as the Mushroom Museum, but you know, we might change that. Why don't you just tell me who you are and what your role is here? Am I, am I the mushroom queen? I don't think so. But, uh, <laughs> mushroom queen. <laughs> there, I get a song. Oh my God. Um, so I am technically the faculty director of the Gornell Plant Pathology Herbarium. And I also teach courses about fungi on campus here. So I, yeah, maybe I am the mushroom queen. Yeah, well, I just found out because I actually took, it was technically the class that you teach now, but uh, you weren't teaching it then. Right. But uh, what is the class that you teach? Magical Mushrooms, Mischievous Molds. Which is just such a fun fun title. You got to take it with George Hudler, a I legend. I, mm -hmm. He's like the OG. He's like the OG <laughs> mushroom guy. It was like one of those courses that, you know, you have a big auditorium, and I think it's probably still the same. Yep. People take it. It's one of those enjoyable classes that, like, everybody takes. And it's a storytelling course, I think, in many, in many ways. That's right. And it really kind of makes you understand and appreciate the mysteries of mushrooms. Yay. So, yeah. <laughs> so um, how did you get into mushrooms in the first place? What was, what was your way in? Oh, I don't like mushrooms at all. They're too <laughs> large and vulgar. I actually really got into things that are really small. The smallest fungi are the fungi that I love the most. Okay, so what's your favorite fungi, actually? Oh, I like the ones that kill bugs. So the cordyceps, like those? Yeah, types? the cordyceps, yeah. the entomophthora. I love those things. Well, here we are. Area. We're in the prep room right now. Yeah. So this is part of the fungal herbarium. And here is sort of where we do shipping and receiving, you might say. People borrow our specimens on loan and we send them out around the world to kind of qualified researchers who use them to study fungi. Fungi have this like love-hate relationship with plants, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, plant, we probably wouldn't have plants today if it weren't for fungi, right? Did fungi predate, predate plants, I would imagine? Yeah, it's, it goes both ways. There's yeah. like the happy little mushrooms that support their trees, and then there's like all the deadly fungi that kill them. The amazing thing about fungi really is how few of them we actually understand. We That's think true. maybe we know 5% of the species that exist in the world. Like, how do we even come up with that number? But the fact is that most fungi don't even have names yet. And so people use our specimens here at the herbarium to do that exploration of fungal taxonomy. What, what is there and what isn't there and what should we call it?
people doing fungal taxonomy now? Because in plants, they're doing a lot of DNA analysis. Is that the same for fungus? Yep. And how, with the DNA, DNA analysis, has that like exploded or are there still like so few researchers who are actually doing that with fungus? Oh, a lot of people are doing that kind of research. And in fact, we recently <clears throat> loaned specimens to a colleague who sequenced the entire genome of the fungus from just a specimen about that big. So that's, that's the new wave and, um, and our specimens are really good for that. I th also think like in our culture, which is like more, I would say Western culture, I mean, Eastern culture, there's always been a deep appreciation for mushrooms, especially also in the culinary purposes. And when we did a tour with one of the gentlemen here who had brought like shiitakes to logs, even then, I think it was back in the 80s or 90s, even then people were like, what is this? So it, I feel like in the Western world, we have yet to really come around to the full beauty of the fungus. And we're, I feel like we're just scratching the surface right now as mushrooms as food, mushrooms as medicine, mushrooms all around us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's true, although, you know, when I first came here to Cornell and I told people, my friends, uh, people I met on the street, what I did for a living, they were like, ew, like, <laughs> why would you study fungi? That's gross. <laughs> but now when I meet people and I tell them I study fungi, they're like, oh, let me show you all my pictures on Instagram. <laughs> and like, <laughs> people are really excited right now. We're having a moment. Yeah, we're having a moment. Um, and there are some cool things. Like, so what do you want to show us like here? The, just like, you know, cause I'd love to get a sense of like the history, how this actually started, who started it? Like who, who was the mastermind behind actually, you know, creating this lab? Yeah, good question. Well, if we could look over here for a minute, this fellow in the middle, uh, Herbert Heiss Wetzel. He has the same birthday as me, <laughs> only like a century earlier. It was but meant to be. You have to get the same kind of glasses, though. Yours are a little oh, it's fancier. It's close. It's close. <laughs> uh, he was the one technically who founded the Cornell Plant Pathology Herbarium back in 1907. Okay. Um, that was but, early. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. early, but yeah. actually a lot of our specimens date from much earlier because we incorporated a different herbarium made by George Atkinson, who mm. came here in the 1880s. Mm. So... Cornell was founded in 1865, and there were mycologists from the very earliest days, but really the date for this herbarium dates from Mr. Wetzel here. I guess that makes a lot of sense because this is an agriculture school. It started with agriculture, and it's kind of, you know, mushrooms and agriculture, I think, kind of go together. Yeah. yeah. So what, who we have here are th sort of through the Hall of Fame. I was going to say, <laughs> these are like the kind of thing when you go into the restaurant in like New York City and you see all the famous people and they have their like, <laughs> they have their like artist Hall of fame. <laughs> portrait signed. <laughs> I'm like the mushroom man. <laughs> so maybe we can start. This is uh, Dr. Richard Korf, yeah. uh, who was my predecessor as the director of this herbarium. Uh, world famous mycologist, award winning, amazing person. And... Um, well, I, let, let's just work through our Hall of Fame here. Herbert Heiss Wetzel in the mm -hmm. middle here. I met his grandson recently. Oh, they, really? He still lives in town. Oh, wow. Um, and this is Durand, um, who was an expert, early, early expert in the 1800s, early 1900s on cup fungi. Oh, neat. Which is one of our great specialties. So our huh. acronym is CUP. But it's an accident. We really have a specialty in cup fungi. And here's a Hall of Fame of discomycetologists, we call them. <laughs> oh, goodness. What else can you uh, share with us and show? Well, um, we have a lot of specimens, which we'll show you in a bit, but we also have like some beautiful collections of art. So these, for example, are the original watercolor illustrations wow. mm -hmm, by a man named Franklin Root Rathbun, who, uh, who painted this one in 1900. It's so um, beautiful. And he made these illustrations for Atkinson's book, um, which we have a really bedraggled copy of right here. <laughs> now, are, now is, this a, is this when they were like literally doing multiple copies? So if there's more than one book, he has to print, uh, he has to paint two of the same? No, they were actually able to print in oh, color by then, okay. but it was really expensive. Wow. So this is a, was a fancy book of its day. Yeah. You can see this, this copy's not in great shape. But this is one of the early field guides of fungi by George Atkinson, a Cornell mycologist. I mean, that is just, pr I love seeing, like going to the Cornell herbarium and seeing the old prints and also seeing like the colors yeah. and the print quality and the, 
imagination that they had way back when, yeah. before even printing, I was just like, oh my God, this is just, this is a labor of love. I mean, it's absolutely exquisite. Right, beautiful. And some of these are, is this more of like a block print kind of thing? Yeah, these are more modern prints by um, a Cornell um, person named Elfrida Abbey. And she is a, a pretty prominent artist, not, mm. not just at Cornell, but beyond. So these are some of her works on mushrooms. She did a lot of botanical illustration and she made this incredible wooden frieze in the second floor of our biology library, yeah. man library. So we're just lucky to have these, but they form part of our herbarium collection here. Here's some cup fungi. Those are cup fungi. Yeah. And then some, is this like a field guide or a field book or is this? This is one of our accession books and we'll tell you a little bit more about that okay. in a bit. Okay. Um, but this is kind of, this is the outer sanctum, I guess. This is where we do packing and sending and digitization stuff. And then you obviously look under the microscopes and everything like that. That's the thing about fungi, you really need a microscope to be able to identify and understand them. Yeah, yeah. so you, you don't spend all of your days here because you're also teaching courses when classes in session, that type of thing. Right. So who is the person who's actually here every day yeah. working on the shrooms? The curator, <laughs> the yeah. Curator. The curator is, is lurking around here somewhere. Okay. So the, the curator of the Plant Pathology Herbarium is Teresa Ituriaga, and uh, I guess I'd like to introduce you to her next. That's wonderful. All right, so we did a little switcheroo. Uh, this is Teresa, and you're the curator here. Yes, awesome. I'm the curator of this wonderful place. I've been here for five years already, and I was a student at Cornell as well. Really? Uh, did, did you take the ma magical mushrooms in the small class? I was a little bit before then. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't exist. She predated the class. <laughs> oh, actually, my professor was Professor Korf. Who, oh, no. who, oh my gosh! One yes, of these guys. Yeah. I, I did my PhD and uh, with him, and uh, that's where I fell in love with the disco my seats. Oh my gosh! Okay, so. Tell me a bit about your day and day here, because obviously you love your job and you fell in love with the fungi. So tell me what you do on a regular basis and what maybe is like the things that like really bring you to life about this uh, gig. Well, what brings me to life is for example, finding a specimen like this, like I found this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a tiny discomycete. So you're, you're looking at these little things right here. Yes. yes. So they're like uh, cup fungi. They can be of many different sizes, mm -hmm. from very small to large. And when these things are looked under the microscope, mm -hmm. you discover the wonders <laughs> and the incredible structures that these little things have. Oh my God, look at this, looks like little pine cones, <laughs> don't they? They are growing on a pine cone. Oh my gosh, that's the, growing on a pine cone. Okay. It's a little so white these thing. Things, and these are expanded probably. These are these are much bigger in this description than what they are in yes. real life. Okay. Totally right. Yeah. So we uh, this uh, many people have started the work of this on, in this my seats. Yeah. Thanks to these wonderful books by Boudier. Mm -hmm. And uh, Boudier was a French mycologist and he, from the late 1800s, mm -hmm. 1900s. And he totally uh, dedicated his life to the illustration and uh, of not only discomycetes and cup fungi, but also of these other very beautiful mushrooms. I would like to show you though, and, and Oh my gosh, I know every time I find a mushroom, I know who I'm gonna call now. I'm so glad I have you on speed dial now. <laughs> I'll be like, Teresa, what's this mushroom? Teresa, how many times do you get people like th that send you who know you? Who oh, be like, uh, oh, what's this mushroom? That's this mushroom. We get a lot. Yeah, we do get a lot of people. And you're like, oh my God, that is so pedestrian. That is such a pedestrian shroom. <laughs> but these ones do not get uh, 
seen so frequently by people because they're so tiny. Yeah, of course. So, so you have to kneel down, mm -hmm. and with Professor Korf, when we collected, for mm -hmm. example, we would actually throw ourselves on the forest floor and just uh, swim through the litter. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love that. It's like you're making snow angels, but in the dirt. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. So that's how I really started. Yeah. Um, well, and I'd like to show you also some of the Baker Disco my seeds, mm -hmm. like the ones that are depicted here. Right. Uh, there's always this like cup fungus that comes up. It's It's got to be common. It's in all of my wood mulch in my garden. It's like a little brown cup fungus and it comes up so frequently. You yes. know what I mean? Yeah. It must be Pisaiza, a brown yeah. one. Yeah, brown one. Yeah, yeah. typically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're lucky. It, it's not that that uh, that common. Oh, are you serious? <laughs> it's not, uh, I feel like it's everywhere in our garden. It must be the wood chips. <laughs> it must be your garden. Yeah. <laughs> so this is uh, a, a fungus that occurs in the tropics and um, Many people, because it's so beautiful, it's also edible. And in Mexico, yeah. they mix it with uh, eggs and yeah. uh, and and uh, make uh, you know all sorts of different dishes with them. It's sold at the markets. I see. I love wood ear mushrooms. You, you know, do? Yeah, I think they're so tasty, and the the texture of them. What is? What's your favorite mushroom to eat now? Oh, you've probably eaten so many different fancy I, ones. I do. I yeah. do. But I, uh, one of my favorites, of course, is. I love enoki, I love shiitake, yeah. I love, uh, the, you know, even the porcini. Yeah. Uh, so you would eat your children is what you're saying. I would. <laughs> <laughs> She's tasted all of them. <laughs> uh, I've tasted many. <laughs> I just remember even in, actually one of the cool things in like the George Hudler's class, which is uh, now Kathy's class, I guess, but we had a, um, we ate a bunch of mushrooms. We prepared so many different ways at the end of the class. And that was the first time I had smut soup. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I'll throw you that smut that we oh, have there. Okay, very good. Okay, some people are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> but those, you're probably thinking like, those ladies are so jovial about mushrooms. <laughs> and, and did you like it? I loved it. Oh. It was very tasty. It, very nice. Yeah. It, maybe it was just how he prepared it. Maybe it was like with a ton of butter. I don't know. <laughs> it was but, really good. Uh, butter is important. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> So anyway, continue. I didn't want to take you off your train of thought. So, um, well, uh, again, microscopic features of this fungus, which are very, very important uh, to understand, were depicted, uh, were illustrated here by Madame Legal. Hmm. And uh, you can see the spores, the spores of this fungus, which measures a couple of centimeters. The spores are a few mic micrometers long. Yeah, and spores are often a way to identify specific yes. fungi, right? Not only just a, 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 a genus, but also probably a species of fungi. Yes. And the color and the shape and all that size and everything along those lines. Exactly. Right. There are lots of characters on spores. You can see striations, for example, here. Some of them a punctiform here. And depending on the different faces, uh, the uh, mic microscopic uh, depths where you go into, you can see different structures inside the spores. Mm -hmm. This, the tissues in the f and on the fungi are also very important. Mm -hmm. the different kinds of tissues. This is where the spores are produced inside a sac. Right. In the case of this uh, ascomycetes, yes, where the cup fungi belong. Yes, exactly. And and, and that means sac, right? And is it an ASCII? Does it does it mean sac? It is actually, yeah. it means sac, yes. yes. Okay. And, for, and spores are forcibly ejected out of that sac. Right, and I, I even, when I think of cup fungi, I also think of like those little bird's nest fungi. <laughs> that look, yes. there's really tiny, it looks like a tiny little miniature bird's nest like that you'd get in a tiny miniature dollhouse. And they shoot the their little spores out too. They look like little bird eggs, right? And they yeah. go, Right out. <laughs> great. Yes, they're great. Yeah. This is a, a, a publication uh, uh, I did some years ago regarding the, the genus, sorry, the, uh, regarding Cochiaina yep. uh, with a colleague uh, that works at the Farlow Herbarium in Harvard and who was also Professor Korf's alumni. Oh, at, at uh, Cornell. At Cornell. And, and then, now you said these are tropical fungi. Yes. But the tropics are not really the epicenter of fungi, right? Or maybe that we we just don't know of, right? It depends on the species. Okay. Of course, it depends on the species and on the 
uh, uh, Africa being one of, as we know, yeah. uh, the oldest, one of the oldest continents, yeah. uh, is very important. And of course, the Guayana Highlands, yeah. the Guayana Highlands, where I come from, yeah. because I'm originally from Venezuela, uh, in the Guayana Highlands, and I have worked there extensively, and in the Amazon area, this fungi fruit all over the place. All over, okay, see, because we're gonna go to Kennett Square, and they claim to be the mushroom capital oh. of the world, in Pennsylvania, <laughs> but you're saying, Fungi grow everywhere. We just might not know <laughs> yes. about it. Kind of square is cultivated. Yes, mushrooms. it's all cultivated. Yeah, a lot of it's cultivated. Oh, I've been there. <laughs> Although I've seen some really amazing bolit mushrooms in Kennett Square. I'm like, this smells like the whole place smells like mushrooms. Really? <laughs> yeah. Bolits in Kennett Square. Ben, ben, yeah, the kind where you like take a stick and it go turns blue underneath. Oh, those beautiful. Ones, yeah, those are really beautiful. So anyway, you've done extensive work in your um, home country of Venezuela, and you say. You know, a lot of these things are growing everywhere. And of course, tell us why fungi are important to the whole ecosystem for those of us who are um, have never taken care to like, or consideration for mushrooms. Well, fungi are, uh, the, we wouldn't be alive without fungi in so many uh, ways. They are uh, wood decomposers. They are or, uh, the organic material decomposers of, of organic matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, uh, uh, without them, we would be walking over cadavers of, of, of plants, uh, yeah. if I can uh, say cadaver for a plant, yeah. but and animals and everything because of the primary decomposers. Right, so, exactly. So we, you're basically saying we'd see plant matter that has never broken down. We would see human matter that has never, animal matter that has never broken down because you need the fungus in order to be able to do that and create your soil and your ecosystem and yes. the basis of it, yeah. Yes, and also the, we, we have, there are lots of uses uh, of fungi and uh, uh, we, we, you know, they're important, for example, in the, uh, in also uh, producing a lot of different acids uh, in the industry, pharmaceutically, we wouldn't yeah. be alive without penicillin, for That's example, right. and many other compounds. And the other thing is the fermentation. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we will show you some models of yeasts, which are uh, unicellular organisms, very, very tiny, and they are the reason why we, dr we can drink beer and wine and all the alcoholic beverages, plus cakes and bread. Exactly, we'd have only flat bread <laughs> if we didn't have yeast. And also, uh, one of the things that we should probably mention too, um, not all plants necessarily have a, a, a unique relationship, but a lot of them actually get their nutrients and help get more nutrients through the relationships that they have with fungi underground it, as yes. well. Yes, yeah. we have discovered that this is an entangled a life and fungi are really the basis that unites us all. Here, I would like yeah. to show you field books. Okay. You know, when people go to the field, this is a, actually from Professor Korf when he collected in uh, Europe uh, in this period, 72 to 73. And uh, every time when you go to the field, you collect, as I showed you that sample mm -hmm. earlier, and you come later, uh, to the hotel room or field station or a tent, mm -hmm. and you write down the characters of the fungus that you collected that day. Yeah. Things like colors, uh, fungi have a, a huge percentage of water, between 70% and 90%. So they all, everything is lost. Yeah. You will see that we keep, our specimens are dehydrated, and they are dehydrated because that's the way to keep them. Right. But they lose all their characters. Right, I remember like as a kid just taking spore prints to help identify, so I'd put it on a piece of paper. If it had a cup, I would put the cup on it and then put a, like a container over it so it actually like you'd have the spore print in the, the morning or whatever. Oh. And, and that was one way to like, I guess, collect in the field, but I'd never be able to dehydrate the, uh, the mushroom unless oh. it was like one of those big like shelf fungi, you know what I mean? That you could get to <laughs> It's very easy. It's just keeping the fungus at 45 degrees centigrade yeah. and they very slowly dehydrate mm -hmm. and then the structures are preserved and can be rehydrated again. Interesting. But of course it's yeah. never like 
if you look at them fresh. Yeah. And that's why, uh, that's why we take this kind of notes. And for example, this is a specimen uh, uh, made in this collection, mm -hmm. which is a Geopora sepulta, and it's a big discomycid, actually, that occurs under, oh, wow. under soil. And you can see that it has here an opening where the spores are able to come out. Yeah. Because spores are like the seeds. Yeah. Spores fungi are the seeds. And I'm, I'm a little worried. I'm like, you have spores on your hands now. <laughs> <laughs> I have spores everywhere. <laughs> we are She's just like a walking spore magnet, like just <laughs> spreading them all over the place. Yeah, no, you are too. I know, and, we all are. We are, <laughs> because we're breathing them in the air yeah. all the time. They're so tiny. <laughs> I think you've breathed a little bit more spores than I have. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're correct, you're correct. Yeah. <laughs> When a fungus comes inside the herbarium, yeah. uh, we, uh, these are accession books, which has a particular number in the herbarium. And you can see the handwriting mm -hmm. of some of these is very difficult. It is very difficult, yeah. To, to understand. So from there, uh, uh, the accession book means the specimen is already in the herbarium under this particular number. Yeah and they will be always uh, assigned to that particular number. Right. These are Professor Atkinson's accession books. So these were from the 1800s, essentially. Uh, yeah, 1900s. 1900s, yeah. Yes, start of the 1900s. And Professor Atkinson, as you know, was a, a huge mushroom and polypore mm -hmm. collector. Mm -hmm. And he uh, produced that beautiful book that we saw. Yeah. And uh, about, 700 new species. He was absolutely an impressive mycologist. Not only did he collect, he photographed, and he made beautiful and wonderful notes. Mm. And one wonders sometimes, where did they find time to do all this? You know? Well, they didn't have social media and they didn't have a phone. <laughs> I know how it was. I grew up in time before social media. I had a lot more time to draw than I do now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I, 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 I experienced the same as yeah, you did. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that the pleasure of the luxury of being able to dive into something that you really enjoy and you could like really concentrate on singularly um, I could appreciate that. I could really appreciate that now, especially because we're like pulled so many different ways in like modern society. Yes, yeah. and we have to be in 10 places at once. Yes, exactly. But this is great. I mean, this area, I feel like you could, you could come, it's like a little bit of a mushroom fortress. You could come in here, you could really decompress. You have all of your gear here, right? You have, you have your uh, microscopes. microscopes and everything. Yes. You have little models, like you have little mushroom models. Oh, I mean, these yes. These are like amazing, like they're, you know, these little um, dioramas. They're amazing, and we have more of them uh -huh. inside that we'll okay. show you. But yes, these are really incredible. And these were uh, German models that were bought by President White when ah, he went with his wife. Yes, when he was, uh, Cornell started, they were looking for teaching tools. Mm -hmm. There were no photographs, no anything at that at a time. So he went to Germany with his wife and mm -hmm. they bought a whole set of teaching material for Cornell. Amazing. Uh, also for the botany uh, department. Yeah. So we have this very, uh, very beautiful teaching models. We have others that I'll show you also. Perfect. This looks like some arts and crafts right here. Yeah, we have fun also. <laughs> <laughs> what we've seen here is everything before it goes into our sacred place, okay. which is the herbarium. Right. The herbarium has to be totally uncontaminated, at least we try, <laughs> and uh, pest-free. Uh, the paper is 100% cotton, acid-free. Mm. Uh, things have to be preserved forever. Yeah. Uh, whatever forever means, but forever. <laughs> For a long uh, time. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Depending on the, of course, of the, on the size of the fungus mm -hmm. that we are going to input into the herbarium, we use big envelopes mm -hmm. or small envelopes, mm -hmm. or which we call packets, and we use also archival bags. And the, ar the archival boxes, which I'll show you some more inside, uh, are also, uh, for thicker specimens mm -hmm. so that they will not crush. 
And when, when you get specimens, I mean, oftentimes, I mean, this goes to say that like the fruiting body is what oftentimes we notice, but there's all this below ground mycelium and everything, which is ostensibly, you know, for lack of a metaphor is kind of like the roots. So how do you take a specimen? Is it only the, the top above ground terra firma or is, do you take anything that's below ground as well? Well, it depends on the group of fungi we're working with. Usually we take the fruit bodies, mm -hmm. which is, uh, that's a colloquial term, uh, for the fungi, that, that, which would be like the apple on a tree. Mm -hmm. uh, as you very well mentioned, the, the majority of the fungus is photophobic. Mm -hmm. It means it hates light. Mm -hmm. So it's always deep inside the soil or buried inside a log mm -hmm. uh, or in a leaf or uh, in many other substrates, but totally immersed. Mm -hmm. It hates coming out only until it needs nutrients, it needs to reproduce, uh, or some event is happening, climatic event like winter, for example. All hermits would understand this. <laughs> <laughs> Sandra's like, yes, I totally understand this. I need to get food. <laughs> I need to get out. I need to find somebody. Uh, <laughs> you're like a fungus. That's great. Good for you. Don't assume it's me. Oh, man. Sander's turning red, but he's behind the camera. Yeah. <laughs> well, welcome to this world. And well, here I wanted just to show you how we glue. Uh, you know, with uh, I'm not going to do it actually, but yeah. glue, we glue the uh, everything so that it's perfectly mm -hmm. flat. And then the label mm -hmm. with all the data that you've seen that was on the field book right. comes into a label. Uh, the name of the fungus, locality, date, collectors. Yeah, I mean, this is a really good label because I'd imagine when you're just like going out there and collecting, you know, some of those things didn't look that uh, that uh, robust of information. You know, <laughs> just try to get all that information. It's hard. And, and, and to keep it all in your head, you know, it's not like you could grab a leaf and uh, and press it in a between a book page. It's the fungus is a little bit more challenging. Yes, Yeah. yes, that's for sure. And uh, we try, the, the more time passes by, the better the labels are made yeah. and more information is provided. Nowadays, of course, you know, we georeference yeah. and we, we use a database called the MycoPortal and, and that's where we keep uh, all our data on the specimens. That gets glued later on, uh, well, in this same event, it gets glued to the packet or to the box, and then they are ready to go inside the herbarium. Okay. And is it, it's so curious to me that they're called, it's still called an herbarium. Oh. <laughs> you know, right? You think that there would have been another name for there it? There is another like, name, a, actually. A mycobarium or, Myco or something. I don't know. What, what, what is the other name? The other name is Fungarium. Fungarium. Yeah. That's a good name. Fungarium, which, which is beautiful. But yeah. we haven't changed the name yeah. uh, because we do have a lot of plants with diseases that are, are fungal diseases right. and also other kinds of diseases like bacteria, viruses, even environmental conditions. So the plants and the fungus are kind of related, so you haven't changed the name, yes, right? Yes, yes. Because it's, it has a lot to do with the like, plant pathology. Exactly. Is what you're saying. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that's why it's called a herbarium. <laughs> yeah, that's so funny. I was thinking about that when you were like, when I was like, I was thinking, okay, well maybe it started with like plant pathology, but you think that they would have like, you know, Liberty Hyde Bailey came up with the name Hortorium. So I was like, you think that they would come up with a different name for fungus. But then I was also thinking at some point, I think people thought fungus was part of the plant world, right? Yes. So yes. that was the other thing where I was like, well, maybe it's a misnomer and it just kind of like uh, transitioned over from the fact when we, when we thought like fungus was a plant. Yes. Yeah. Up to the 1950s. Which is crazy, isn't it? Because if you look at old biology books, you would see that like some bacteria are considered plants, right? You'd see some, like the fungus considered plants. We had, we had less kingdoms than we do now. <laughs> yes, yeah. absolutely. And uh, well, it's, it's reasonable people did not have the tools that we, that we do. And uh, the presence of chlorophyll was not uh, a, a 
considered such an important uh, uh, distinguishing, uh, I mean, character to distinguish the uh, the plants and the fungi. There are many other things, of course, that yeah. distinguish a plant and a fungus. Uh, there are several characters. You know, the fungi, for example, do not have cellulose. On their cell walls, they have chitin, and they eat in a totally different way. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, plants, thanks to the chlorophyll, they are able to absorb uh, nutrients from the soil and transform it into sugars, and fungi cannot do that. Fungi decompose. They excrete uh, enzymes into the media, right. and then they absorb them back. So their stomach is like, on, in a way, on like the outside, because they're <laughs> excreting their like ex excretory acids or whatever in order to be able to digest where we digest internally. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know your fungi. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> just the, the generic thing. I could, I could shoot the shit for a while. But, <laughs> but is, is it also true that we are more closely related to fungi than we are to plants? Totally and true. Fungi, and more closely related than fungi are to plants. Yes, Isn't we are. Isn't that crazy? Isn't it, that poof, mind blown? <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. And that's why sometimes, you know, when we are drying fungi, mm -hmm. people People just smell something uh, there that re relates to you. I mm. think we can move. I don't the know fungarium. if you want to see this uh, exhibit because they're really, they were considered fungi at one point, but they're not considered fungi anymore. Oh, interesting. Okay. And uh, they're slime molds. Oh, slime molds, which I find all the time. They're so creepy, right? They are. They're they really neat. Oh, look. Is this one of one of those? That, that's, that's, a, a slime, that's a slime mold. That's a slime mold, and you can see the specimen there wow. and the photograph. So, what? Where do these fit in the world? They are a different kingdom, okay. separated also from fungi. They are uh, in included in the big protist group. Okay, uh, in, that has been subdivided into many kingdoms. Yeah. So, uh, but interesting thing is that some of these, they are just one, one uh, big cell. Yeah. Uh, they are a multinucleate uh, organism. This would be their, their, uh, their, their fruiting structures, this over there, where they do form spores. Yeah. And that's why they were considered for many, many years to be fungi. Right. Until, of course, uh, a, a fungi are, are, though there are many unicellular, they, these organisms, for example, have cellulose on their cell wall. Hmm. They don't have chitin. Right, so it's more like a plant in that matter, right? Because it has cellulose. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And, uh, and, but it feeds in a way, and you know, feeding is a very important uh, way of classifying the different kingdoms. Hmm. And this feed like us. Yeah, it moves too. Uh, like we we've, we have this we have uh, this yellow slime mold that often comes on our uh, compost and our composted bark mulch. And it it's kind of it's funky. All of a sudden you have this like bright yellow spot, you know. And and they move. They it's like it in unison and whatever. Yes, it's yeah. very interesting, the study of them. This is few, probably what you have is Fuligoseptica. Probably, yeah. Uh, which is dog vomit slime mold. <laughs> that's exactly what it looks like. <laughs> and that's exactly the term. Yeah. So uh, we do have a big collection of, uh, of, of the slime molds. And this is a wreath that I made <laughs> from rhizomorphs Wow. of Armillaria melia, oh my which is goodness. a very pathogenic fungus. And uh, you... I, I wouldn't quit your day job. I don't know if you'd go into uh, wreath making. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that a basket? <laughs> uh, I'll, take your, I'll take your advice. <laughs> these are special, instead of hyphae, which are just filaments, yeah. these are bunches of hyphae that reunite and uh, uh, form root-like structures. It's crazy. I mean, they're really thick. It's they, like a vine. Yeah, and that's wow. how they disperse through the forest, killing other trees. Wow. Armillaria melia, the honey mushroom. And now we enter our most precious part. The herbarium. The herbarium. The fungarium herbarium. 
I actually, I have to say, I, I stepped in here before and I was like, where's the creepy guy with the monocle? It just kind of feels like that. <laughs> oh, well, this place. She's like, it's just me. <laughs> it is me. It's, I, I spend all my time here since I was a student. Um, amazing. So uh, I did my work here and coming back to Cornell and to this place, the smell just brings lots of wonderful, wonderful moments and the history that this place inspires are the many mycologists that have devoted hundreds of hours of their lifetimes working in this area. Yeah. In each of these cabinets, it's just magnificent and so mysterious. It's one of those things when you find somebody who's so passionate about something that, you know, we may have never had appreciated like underneath our feet or underneath our noses, it's so infectious. I'm sure you're gonna turn so many folks on to like mushrooms or like make people see fungi in a whole new light. And this this goes for all, like, you know, I got into entomology because like my professor literally threw himself into the water to chase after a roll of gig beetle, which is like a little <laughs> bug with a bubble on its butt. Like, you know, when you have people that have that kind of excitement for uh, an aspect of life, it is so infectious and it really comes off. Uh, and so it's, it's just so marvelous. And I'm so <laughs> glad that you like, you know, the smell of this, the place, it, you could see that it's really touched you in a, in a magnificent way, which is so lovely. It has. I have dedicated my whole life to the study of fungi. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love them. <laughs> so what, what do we see here? I mean, well, this is exquisite. We have teaching models, uh, as, as we saw, our beautiful German teaching models, bought by White, mm -hmm. the first Cornell president on, on his trip to Europe and they are made of clay, and they are just fascinating. This was the way professors had to show their students during the winter what a yeah. fungus looked like. Most of them, these are uh, mushrooms, but there are, you can see the different sizes, mm -hmm. the colors. Are these, are these sized to real life size that you would see in or in the wild, or are these like expanded versions of them? Well, these are expanded versions. Mm -hmm. For example, you can see this is huge, much, much yeah, bigger. much larger. This is also a, a, a cup fungus. Mm -hmm. And they were uh, made in Germany. Some have their uh, descriptions over here, for example. Many of these have changed their, the, the, the generic name said yeah. yes. Yes. This. Do you know who made these? Well, we are not totally sure, yeah. but there is information on the back, and we have a project of uh, working with these mm -hmm. models and uh, keeping them up. I mean, honestly, we have such an international contingent of people who watch the channel, so if anybody out in our in Germany or whatever uh, can identify some of these things or know of this or, or, or have seen them out there too, that would be kind of cool. So just like let us know. Yes. It's pretty neat. What this, is what is this? Well, this is amazing. These are our. Um, they're made of resin. They're also models, and we were talking about yeasts before. Yes. These are yeasts. Oh my gosh! It looks like somebody who's created like those little balloon animals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. These are budding yeasts. You know, they can start as a a single cell, and then they start budding to produce their daughter cells, mm -hmm. and that's how they reproduce asexually. Some of them remain together and form this kind of mycelial-like structures, huh. but individually there's unique cells. So these are the reason of our industries, as I mentioned before, uh, and I don't want to pretend that uh, it's my, only my alcohol love and my cake, <laughs> and my cake love. <laughs> so this would be a hyphae of a true fungus. Mm -hmm. 
And inside, they have depicted some of the organelles and other things. Hmm. So uh, a high fees of filament, and uh, even though they're all together in the same kingdom, it's interesting to know that some are unicellular and others are filamentous. Right. A fungus, interesting enough, is composed of only filaments and filaments and filaments. Mm. And when they form fruit bodies, like this ones, right. this is what's inside the soil and inside the substrates. This is cool too, look at this. Oh, oh wait, there's a little bird's nest fungus. Yes! Except that's huge, they're much tinier than that. You wanna see? Yeah, they're very tiny as you say. Where do you yeah. get yours? Well, ours are just in our mulch all the time. It's we, we have so many little fungi in our garden, I guess. Like that cup fungi and this always grows in our, uh, on our mulch in oh, our garden. Really? Yeah. That's amazing. Well, as you were saying, this is a bird that's fungus yeah. because this looks like a nest with a little eggs inside. Yeah. This is a French model made by Azou, this hmm. uh, famous person that worked with papier mache. He was a, a medical doctor and an anatomist. Hmm. And I want to open it up for you oh, wow. because it's wonderful. The oh way it opens gosh. up, and you can see all the little oh peridules, yeah. the little eggs inside are called the peridules. And when a drop of water falls in, they just swish yeah. into the air and they attach themselves to blades of grass, the spores are inside. That's amazing. It, yes. I, I would be more amazed if there was like, when you open it up, they actually triggered. <laughs> <laughs> like a jack in the box kind of thing. Well, they, they do. Oh, 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 well, they do. <laughs> in a way. <laughs> Give me a heart attack, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll put them back together yeah. later, but he, some of them I have already uh, oh, taken yeah. out. Oh, so cool. And, and you, you know, people can see this is a Manita Cesaria, for example, the Caesar's favorite. And uh, I mean, this is just so ingenious. So it's like, because when you cut a mushroom, it could look very different. So he's literally doing physical cross sections, like in his models. You're right. He yeah. was an anatomist. Yeah. He did whole horses, human beings, oh. animals. Or in papier mache, oh using the same technique. Uh, the, I mean, the dedication. Yes. And you want to open the morel? Yeah, let's open the morel. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, there is a. You just have to open it up, like separating the two halves. Oh, I see. Oh, see. Oh, yeah. <gasps> Look at that. So cool. <laughs> the morel is hollow. And uh, false morels are not hollow, so that's a way to distinguish the two I can morels. see anybody who ever wanted to marry you would put the ring in here and be like, okay, <laughs> open it up, open it up! Oh, yes! <laughs> Maybe that's not how it happened. <laughs> it's like, I, I, well... You're like, that would have been a good idea. It would have been a very good idea. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> and then we have some, uh, this one is, also wonderful. This is, you were asking about the real uh, sizes. Yeah. Well, this one, for example, uh, is, <laughs> this is phallus. I, I, this, this is phallus, this is uh, the genus. Yes, that, that <laughs> genus, uh, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, but, it's, <laughs> but it's the genus, but if you open this, uh, well, this is how I sometimes spend my weekends. <laughs> I swear she didn't have any fermented drinks before this. <laughs> no, no, I did. Swear, swear. <laughs> you know how it looks inside. Yeah. And comparing it to the immature, the immature one, mm -hmm. which looks like this. Right, they're, they're like little eggs, right? Exactly. Yeah. You've yeah. seen them in nature? Yes, I have actually. And then you're going to have the pleasure of opening this. Right, and so the, uh, that's so interesting. Wow. Man, this guy was genius. Like, do you have to go and through all of this? Well, he yeah. was one of the hits of the Paris exhibit. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, uh, the Universal Paris exhibit yeah. in the 1870s. Or yeah. Something. So this little thing becomes this that. when it expands. Yeah. 
Like, because I, I see even stink horns, right? Stink this horns. is a stink this, horn. This is a stink horn. Okay. Yes. I've also seen a stink horn in our garden. That was the first time I saw a stink horn was in our garden. I have to go and collect in you your have garden. To, you have to come to our <laughs> garden. It's like a garden of fungus. Yeah, you have a paradise there. <laughs> <laughs> and these are our liquid. Uh, we also keep a collection of liquid uh, specimens. And this is a smut. That's our corn ate. smut. Yes. The corn smut. It, the, the soup is, uh, it's black. What is it called in Mexico? Because it's a delicacy in Mexico. Yes, in, in Mexico. It uh, starts with an H. It's huitlacoche. Uh, yeah, huitlacoche. Yeah. You could get it in a, you could get it literally in a can. They'll, they'll sell it in a can. You could buy it in a can because it's like a little delicacy. But that's corn smut. So you're eating the smut. But can't this also be a toxic? Or is that something... It's a, it's a pathogen yes. for corn, for corn. but okay. it's cultivated because it's so delicious. So some corn is uh, dedicated to the production of, of this smut. Right. I had it inside a crepe once. Oh, interesting. And, and it was very nice. Like a savory nice. crepe? Or like a, a, like or a, 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 a sugary tortilla. Yeah. Well, I, I had it twice, one in a crepe, yeah. more elaborated, and the other time I had it... Uh, in a tortilla, mm. and, the tor and the tortilla was very powdery. Yeah, uh, and of course the other one was cooked and more uh, yeah. refined. So there are all ways that people eat this mud fungus. Has lots of protein, of mm. course. Uh, again, our morel, very nice, processed in in liquid, and this is a false morel. A helvella, which... Yeah, that's a false morel, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and people have to be careful because some of them can be poisonous. Right. And you were talking about cordyceps. Yes, those are big. <laughs> These are huge. Those are massive. <gasps> yes, this is cordyceps capitata. And uh, many of them infect uh, insects and yeah. larvae of insects. And, uh, and it's become a very popular medicine as of late. Yes. Cordyceps, yeah. You're right. Yeah. It's I, don't, I can't imagine collecting them. when If they're that big, then the, the, it's not that bad. But some of them are really tiny. Have you seen the little bunches in, yeah. in, uh, in the Chinese markets? Yes, I have seen the little bunches in the Chinese markets. And one time I actually, like, because I don't look out for them, but uh, one time I was walking in the woods and I actually saw an insect with a little cordycep coming out of its head. Oh, my. And, and when you find something that, like, small and seemingly insignificant, it's like, it feels like such a huge discovery. Yes. Because <laughs> you're able to actually see it. <laughs> you're right. Yeah. And they creep, you know, that they make the, the insect uh, behavior change totally. Right. So the insect creeps to the top of the, of the canopy or the, or, or the leaves. A stem or a plant, yeah. And then the insect gets attached through the mycelium mm -hmm. to the to the leaf, underside of the leaf, and then that's the way that the fungus disperses yeah, its spores. So the, basically, the fungus controls the insect to go to the top in order to like put out the spores so it goes everywhere. It's just so, <laughs> it's so zombie. It's so it zombie-esque. It is zombie. And this is ginseng. Oh, wow. Uh, contaminated with verticillium. Wow. These are very old specimens. Yeah. We, don't, we do not uh, do anything with them. Mm -hmm. We just keep them. Tomato, affected mm -hmm. with fusarium, which is still up to date. Mm -hmm. And part of our wine we call a herbarium. And this is a beautiful earth, 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 star, earth star. Right, yeah. Which are uh, wonderful uh, to find. Yeah. Do you ever, ever have to like fill in the liquid or refill the liquid or no? Oh, because... that's a question I should not answer. <laughs> <laughs> because we don't know exactly what's in what's there. What's in it? Okay. Yeah. So right. uh, we preserve them like this yeah. and uh, we do not touch them. Yeah. <laughs> and so this is some old photos now. Yes. Okay. We, we keep 60,000. Uh, photographs. Are these the digitized at all? They are. Okay. Yes. So at, people can actually go and see, like if they have a plant problem or something along those lines, they could actually see these. They can. Most of them, mm -hmm. not all of them, 20,000 are digitized. The rest are not digitized. Mm -hmm. We, uh, the interesting thing, we have lots of different kinds of photographs, uh, not only mushrooms uh, and fungi, and these were all made by Atkinson himself wow. in his camera. Wow. With glass negatives. Crazy. We do have a collection of all his negatives. Yeah. 
And uh, of course, these are the printouts. Uh, and uh, we have diseases. This is Charles Horton Peck, a very famous New York mycologist. We keep also uh, photographs of famous mycologists. Nice to see he was, uh, was not maybe that organized. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to come into my office. <laughs> and also we uh, some agricultural practices, like here. I just pulled out a few so that, uh, so we have a record. It's amazing yeah. the amount of information it's that we have here. It's insane amounts of information. I mean, how many other fungariums or herbariums exists like this in the world? Fungaria themselves are not that many. Uh, there may be uh, maybe 60 or so in the yeah. world. Yeah, and that's what I was talking about because I have been and I've seen many different herbariums, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they have fungus in that herbarium. So fungariums, you're saying there's maybe like five dozen or so in the world or maybe less than that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, crazy. I mean, it's really uh, precious to be able to see this. So is there more that you could share with us here? Yes. So this is the Duran Herbarium. And this is how he uh, originally uh, organized it. So inside of each of these drawers, there is a little tiny packets because many of these were his own collections, but he yeah. collected tiny things. Yeah. There are little, little things that you cannot really see yeah. with your eye. Right. They are sitting on the substrate, uh, on the cortex, and uh, one needs a, a, a dissecting scope to, yeah. to look at them. Yeah. So the study of, of this comycetes really is uh, a very, very delicate and careful and, and a laborious study. Mm. Because from these little specimens, from each of the tiny little cup cups, we section them with a freezing mm. microtome. Oh my and God. And then we observe it under the uh, dissecting scope and microscope. Yeah. Of course, we have uh, many other collections. Uh, and I want to show you the Corf collection. Mm -hmm. Then this was my professor. I'm very, very proud to say that I was, a fo I, I stand on these shoulders. Yeah. Some of them, this is Strosmerius, a new species mm -hmm. that I dedicated to, to Corf. Uh, the Corfiae, mm -hmm. I called it, and uh, we keep them, they are on their host. Right, so you keep them on the substrate on that the, they're growing on. Yes, yeah. and we keep slides, mm -hmm. and uh, so the Strosmeria would be here. Seems amazing. Uh, I, I had even forgotten about this until yesterday. Mm. Uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult to see, but they're tiny, tiny little grayish. Little, I see like whitish kind of, yeah, exactly. gray speckles, yeah. And uh, the interesting thing about this fungus mm -hmm. is that not only the sexual state uh, occurs mm -hmm. by itself, also the asexual state. Mm -hmm. And that has been quite difficult before molecular biology to put the two of them together the sexual and the asexual state. Mm -hmm. Usually they occur in different hosts at right. different times of the year. Right. But in this case, Strosmeria and Pseudospiropis, they do grow many times next to each other. I want to show you the whole herbarium, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and these are our wonderful and unique Exicaris. We have two very important ones. This, the, uh, that's called the bar. Barbe Bousier, mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And they were sets of collections that people would buy mm -hmm. or would subscribe to. And so like uh, a magazine almost. Like a magazine, exactly, huh. but of fungal specimens because this is one of the For only sets only. in the world. Wow. <laughs> so they were... Uh, so people would literally subscribe to this. They would subscribe to this. There was an expert that issued the ex each of the exicaris. And uh, the value that these collections have is that the, there's an expert gave the name to this specimen and maybe issued 10 of them, mm -hmm. uh, sold maybe some. Mm -hmm. Others were given for free as exchange with institutions. Hmm. And uh, each of these is, uh, you know, you're sure and the name attached to that specimen would mm -hmm. be used for research and for comparisons. Right. We do have also this yeah. uh, very interesting teaching tools as well. 
that are the password to collection. You know, there are our mounts. Mounts were done, again, to explain diseases and explain things to students. Mm -hmm. So this would be oat smut. Yes. And, 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 you know, you can see all the way from healthy to very diseased. Right. And um, this, for example, is a beautiful uh, variegated, probably a virus, uh, and it was collected in Wetzel's garden. You can see the dates of these things. This was 1935, but this, this is what started the Dutch craze right here for these uh, variegated tulips. You're right. <laughs> yeah. uh, you are an expert on that. This was the downfall of the, of the Netherlands. <laughs> Just kidding. There is a whole history to that, though. <laughs> yeah, I don't know much about it. You would know much more he would, than no, me. No, he's, he's, he's Dutch. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> well, uh, we... And again, more and more diseases, you know, you, uh, to explain different cycles of this is, uh, for example, a very terrible rust. And this is on Berberus vulgaris, which yes. is our barberry. And it changes hosts. Interesting. So it, it goes from one host, one of the phases. Oh, I is, see. So it needs these three hosts. Almost like a tick needs to go from a white-footed mouse to a... They're two hosts, yeah, actually. Yeah, to a deer. Okay. They're two hosts, but they produce, in one of the hosts, they produce different structures. Hmm. Uh, and uh, it's a very, Puxinia graminis, it's the name. And uh, it's very, de it's a devastating uh, disease on, on wheat hmm. and, uh, uh, and other crops as well. Interesting. I think we've had, I think we have that, um, somebody was explaining to me, and I think it's a fungus, where it goes from goldenrod to white pine. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so if you have goldenrod or even currants, currants sometimes to yes. white pine. Those are rusts. Yeah. Rusts okay. have that that uh, incredible cycles. Hmm. Uh, that life cycles are very complicated, many of them which are not known yet. Yeah. Because they do, uh, you find them in one host and then you don't know what happens on yeah. the next. And then rusts are the ones that you often see on uh, plant leaves that look like rust. They lit literally look like orange spots or things along those lines. So those are the ones that, and they're quite common. You see them all the time. Uh, and well, there are some other of the diseases. Uh, uh, here, uh, these are more modern, the yeah. ones making this kind of thing, and these are older. I think this is what we've had. And in our blue spruce, oh, they did had you? this like needle cast disease and it dropped a lot of its needles eventually. Yes. Maybe it's something similar to that. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, I am I'm sure it must be something, if not the same thing, or something similar. Yeah. Uh, and this is what a pressed specimen looks like, huh? Exactly. Wow. And this part Kathy was going to explain yeah. about Atkinson. All right, we are back in action here. So tell us a bit more about what this is. Like they're press specimens. Well, it looks like a lot of crap, doesn't it? <laughs> no, it looks good. <laughs> it's just because it's really old. So these date from the early 1900s, and most of them are specimens collected by George Atkinson. Here he is. Oh man, with the boots. Oh my God, and the big mustache. The amazing that. mustache. Amazing mustache. And he was really Cornell's most prolific early mycologist, and and maybe you heard from Teresa that he's he was a mushroom expert. So. We pulled out some of Atkinson's mushrooms to show you. Oh my God. So this these is are a piece of collected in the Ithaca area in the early 1900s. Wow. This is a famous mushroom, Amanita muscaria. Oh, okay, of course. Right? It's yeah. the Super Mario it's, mushroom. It's The red one with the white, and every, yeah, some the people think that dots. this is what Christmas came from. Right. Oh, it's the most wonderful time of the year. <laughs> and it, it's a vaguely uh, psychedelic, yeah. but not in a very nice way. But anyway, Amanita muscaria is an iconic mushroom. In our area here in the Northeast, it's yellow with polka dots, not so mm -hmm. much red. Mm. Mm -hmm. So these are some of his specimens. And you can see um, that 
his specimens were very beautiful <laughs> when they were first collected. Right. And that when they dry down, they really just look like crap. Yeah. But for a mycologist, they have all the characters you would need to look closely at them, to analyze them. You could probably also do genetics on these yeah. still, right? Yeah. yeah, you could get DNA out of there and look at it. Um, so these are just some of his things. And we thought you might like to see this beautiful um, shelf fungus, yeah. Aganoderma. Wow. But it's not in the herbarium as a Ganoderma. It's in the herbarium because it's got another fungus oh, growing on it. crazy. A little hypocrea or hypomyces. Yeah. Yeah, and you can see they wrote the number right on it. Wow. <laughs> They're a little hard to keep, these big ones. Well, some of the, some shelf fungi that I used to have, the artist conks, right? Yeah. I, I would take those off the trees and I would like do a little sketch on the bottom and right, stuff like that. Right. I think, I don't know. I don't we know could... if a lot of kids did that, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So these are just some of other Atkinson specimens. So he described tons of species, a lot of them from our area of central New York, a uh, very important mycologist. Well, and it's also nice to have, too, because like one of the things that I, I think is always so wonderful here is that, you know, you have a university like this who has had hundreds of years of documenting some of these things. So when you go out into your environment, things are already, you know, pretty well documented. So you could always find the answer to them. But it always impresses me that there's still probably even under our nose here when all this documentation, there's probably so much to still know. Yeah, and imagine in his time, you know, in his time, even the sort of iconic poisonous white angel of death mushroom mm. didn't have a name yet for North America. So he gave that one a name, Amanita bisporigera. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Um, this is Atkinson's herbarium right here, a part of it. So you just keep his collection separate from the others? We do, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can see that early in mycology, Atkinson kept his specimens a lot like the plant herbarium yeah. keeps their plants. Yeah, absolutely. By just putting them on sheets. Amazing. So if we pull out one of these things, well, there's some, uh, that's not antique bubble wrap. Yeah. <laughs> but here's a little fungus, you know, unlike plants, when we open these, there's not some beautiful pressed leaf in right. there. It's, it's just a packet yeah. with a speck in it. <laughs> and then you have this probably there so it doesn't crush. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And then other things, they don't fit in packets. So they're in these little boxes. It's like little jewelry boxes. Uh-huh, 1880 in Florida, wow. this one. Wow, Ooh. wow, that's still colorful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, isn't that pretty? That's yeah, little, it looks like peppermint bark. That's a little, mm. <laughs> mm, we should try Man, it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Tastes like chocolate. <laughs> All right, let's keep going down this way. But here's a really cool collection that's more recent. These um, were collected as a part of an inventory of the Lindsay Parsons ah, Biodiversity Preserve. Which is actually, we just did uh, some snowshoeing there. Yeah. Oh, very yeah. nice. Yes. Well, back in the, what year was this? Back in the late 90s, um, some Cornell folks worked with Shearing Plow, a big pharmaceutical company, mm -hmm. to not only do an inventory of the fungi that lived in that preserve, but then see if we could develop drugs from them. Right, right. which is what the partner, partnership is with the Lindsay Parsons Biodi Biodiversity Preserve, because I yeah. think that, that partnership is with a German pharmaceutical com mm -hmm. company. Mm -hmm. And that was like some of the vision that... Um, Tom Eisner had, who That's actually right. is the founder of Chemical Ecology, was my, one of my mentors here at Cornell. And his idea is like, well, why don't we actually, you know, look into conservation, conserving large tracts of land so that we don't destroy it? And what is there, what is the a kind of partnership that we could create, a public-private partnership that we could create? And pharmaceuticals is one of those because a lot of our pharmaceuticals come from plant-based or fungus-based medicines. Right. Think of penicillin. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a, a, the, we call these voucher specimens. If you go and you collect a fungus somewhere and you want to be able to talk about it, you have to be able to prove that you identified it correctly. So if you look inside these packets, what we hope we'll find is <laughs> wow. the little mushroom that was originally collected there um, and then cultured as part of this project hmm. and then tested by this pharmaceutical company. So that's called a voucher specimen. It's like your proof that you really saw it. Right. Yeah. So that's one way in which we store specimens. But maybe let's go down there. Yeah, sure. What else can we find? Oh, and we were just talking about the Lindsay Parsons, I don't know, 
here's the thing is that, that I found right around the time the Lindsay Parsons Preserve was being founded, this at the bottom is a dead beetle. Oh. And so all is this, this like a little stuff. cordyceps kind of Yes, thing? it's a cordyceps. Yeah. That's right. So this is the fungus that killed this beetle. Uh, one of the students in my class found it in a log somewhere and mm -hmm. brought it back. It turned out to be the, the sexual part of the life cycle that nobody knew about yet of the fungus that makes an important uh, uh, drug called yeah. cyclosporin. Wow. And it was super exciting and happened right around the time uh, the land trust was working on their new preserve. Wow. So that was cool. That's so neat. I feel like this whole herbarium is just, um, f you know, it's got a lot of fungi in it, but really what it has are just beautiful stories. Yeah. So many stories. Well, the fact that you could retain some of these stories, like, the, you know, when you come into a place like this, you know, uh, subsuming all of those stories and being able to carry those on, I think are really important. So I think it's important just even having the faces of the people that were here so that you, you can preserve those stories because you are preserving specimens, but you're preserving the stories, like you said. Mm -hmm. Now here you, see, you have some stuff um, from China. So mm -hmm. obviously mushrooms are extremely important to China. What, what kind of relationship did you have uh, or the herbarium have with this? Well, these particular specimens were a gift to us um, from the Institute of Microbiology of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And they're beautiful specimens of Ganoderma that were cultivated and grown in China, where Ganoderma is a really important mm -hmm. medicinal and even culturally important yeah. mushroom. Here, even, they're starting to become more uh, culturally important, I think, as well, for med as medicine. Yeah, and they, they can be cultivated. They come in lots of different varieties. And they're said to boost immunity and health. In the 1920s, um, a, a scholar from China named S.C. Tang came to study at Cornell. He, he came to study mycology. He, in fact, went on to be the father of mycology in China. Hmm. Um, and that became really important to us, not just because, you know, we're Cornell proud, but also because at the time of the Japanese invasion of China in about 1930, the collections that, that this person, S.C. Tang, had, had amassed of Chinese fungi were endangered by that invasion. And he did this spectacular thing, which was to pack the collections, load them into an ox cart, which traveled then across China into the Indian Sea, where those collections traveled by boat to Cornell. Oh my God. For safekeeping. Wow. Yeah. Let's go look at a picture of okay. him up here. Um, and then many, many years later, after those collections had been here in our herbarium for a long time, um, here's his book. We, we decided it was time for them to go back. Yeah. So we returned those collections to China. There he is. Oh, wow. That's crazy. So after founding um, Mycology in China, he, he lived a tough life. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a, a time of war and a time of great change in China. Um, but we were very pleased to, to be able to return some of his original specimens mm -hmm. to China. Over 2,000 of them, in fact. Wow. So what we did was we split the collections that we had because we knew he meant to send them here. Mm -hmm. And we sent back half mm -hmm. so that now scientists in China can work on their you know, the legacy of this man and study them in place. Well, I'm sure also, you know, given that there's so few fungariums around the world, like you could always, you're always sending collections back and forth. Yeah, you know, as that's well. right. So, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exquisite, exquisite story. Wonderful piece of history. Yeah, pretty exciting to be able to, you know, I'm a fungus person. <laughs> this is some kind of international diplomacy. <laughs> Did we look at these already? No, not at all. These are just more of these beautiful Ganodermas. And what's interesting about this batch, I think, is that these samples are from the tree. So what we have are the fruiting bodies, like this one. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a kind of bracket fungus or conch. And the spores fall out of the pores on the bottom of the fruiting bodies. Um, but really, that tree, that tree that is host to these fruiting bodies is where the fungus has spent its whole life mm. eating the wood. 
And so these specimens um, are in the herbarium because they show you what kind of wood damage this fungus causes in trees. And also what kind of wood it grows on as well, because right. a lot of them are sometimes really specific. What about these? <laughs> what about these? Look at these. <laughs> these are good. Okay, these are really exciting because these are some modern specimens just collected in the last few years, right? This one's from July 2021. Mm. And they come from a really expert amateur collector named Paula DeSanto. Um, and Paula DeSanto um, has been studying fungi just on her own for a long time, has learned from lots of other amateur and professional mycologists, truly expert. And she's been recording fungal observations on a website called iNaturalist. And these are the vouchers for her iNaturalist specimens, which we're really happy to take in. Awesome. So where is she actually collecting? Just all over or just where she is or? Well, she lives in central New York. Yeah. And so a lot of her collections are from central New York. That's cool. Uh-huh. And, um, and we're, we're really pleased to have them. And, and iNaturalist is, for those who don't know, I mean, it's, it's quite popular. You know, yeah. you could actually see like a, a bird or an animal or a fungus or a, a, a anything that's kind of basically living in the biotic sphere. Mm -hmm. And you could document it with a GPS point and like put information on. And if you don't know what it is, there's a ton of experts and amateurs that are on there that will help identify it, which I think is such a wonderful little uh, community. Yeah. Yeah, so these are the ones Paula collected. Amazing. And again, if we look inside here, guess what? There's a beautiful coral fungus in there. Wow. So are some of these um, identified already? Or, like, uh, how, do you, how do you, if people send you specimens, how does it actually work? Like, do you say, oh, no, we have another one, we have that No, specimen. no, no, we, we like getting specimens, but okay. we only take specimens that are identified. I see. So you okay. can't just send us all, like, the weird stuff from your backyard. Don't do that. <laughs> You're like my toe fungus. <laughs> no <in>. toe <laughs> fungi. <laughs> Can you identify this? It's growing underneath my toenail. <laughs> No, no don't. ideas. Don't get any of those no, ideas. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so we take identified fungi. Usually they're from people who are, are pretty, pretty good experts mm -hmm. at identifying fungi. And, you know, our goal is to, is to, is to sort of embody biodiversity. Like the, the knowledge of what grows around us is embodied in these specimens. So 100 years from now, these specimens should still be here and they'll serve as evidence for what grew in that spot. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting because oftentimes when you go to like plant herbariums, you have specimens and you're like, this doesn't grow here anymore. Right. Or like they put in a parking lot and that plant is no longer here. Um, and, or they just did a big, actually came out of, partially out of Cornell, like a big uh, survey of past museum specimens of bees mm -hmm. and what is actually currently here and how that has changed over the last, you know, 40, 50, 60 years. And the same you could do with this as right. well. That's right. I guess another purpose for mycology that's kind of special is that the names of fungi are changing really quickly just because of how little we have known. And as we learn more, we have to kind of change the names of things to reflect how they're related to each other. Um, and we don't change every name of everything, but sometimes we learn something that leads us to change it. This fungus, Stropheria hardii, was described here in Ithaca by <laughs> George Atkinson, whose mm -hmm. collections we have. And Paul has found it again near Mexico, New York. Huh. Um, but I didn't even know there was a Mexico, New no, York. I, it must <laughs> be really cool there. <laughs> well, so. that, that's pretty amazing. I mean, Stropharia is also a mushroom that we often... That's a, that's a common edible one, too, that are people growing, but I think it's well, a different... Certain species yeah, of Stropharia are good edibles. Yeah. yeah. Some not. Yeah. But I guess the issue with the name changing is that if you just say, oh, I found um, cordyce Cordyceps militaris, mm -hmm. and you just write it down, but you don't have a specimen to go with it, then maybe 50 years from now, we find out that Cordyceps militaris, a beautiful bug-killing fungus, is somebody recognized that it was really three different species. Mm. And if you look back at your record from years ago and it just says Cordyceps militaris, well, which one of those three was it? Right. But if you have a specimen, you can go back and find out. 
Well, I would actually love to see glass plate <clears throat> negatives. I mean, this is kind of the old school where you have to mix your own chemicals and everything, right? Well, yeah. Yeah. And and so what you do is you'd make the emulsion with, you know, silver. This is a really heavy oh emulsion on these. This is one of Atkinson's negatives. Like, can you see it against the light? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Wow. It looks like an x-ray yeah. of mushrooms. So he was a real pioneer in this, um, the production of photographs of mushrooms. And so that's what that, that negative has that photograph on it. Um, he had a big old wooden camera with a bellows on the front and he'd bring everything Get back and black. pose it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Reading yeah. little dioramas. I mean, can you yeah. imagine? Wow. And they're just really beautiful. And we, we have thousands of them because he was a big documenter of fungi. And I and wrote a field book and lots of papers about mushrooms. Um, so we thought we'd just show you this range of cabinets right here, all these drawers, they're full of Atkinson's glass negatives. Unbelievable. Yep. We still have a really large image collection, over 60,000 images we house here. We're working on digitizing them, but yeah, it might take a while. I think there's like 20,000 up or 20,000 yeah, on our up. website. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Don't Google Mushroom Museum, even though I said it. We'd probably come up with something else. No. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much. This is really a labor of love, and it's a labor of love over several generations, which yeah. is incredible. And thank you so much for preserving these specimens, but also preserving the stories, because that's what makes it even more interesting. It's a really exciting place to work. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems a little dim and cool. We keep it a little <laughs> cool to keep the bugs down. Every cabinet has treasures. Yeah. It's, a, uh, it's like a wonder common. It's like cabinets of wonder. Exactly. Absolutely. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed the tour through the Cornell University Plant Pathology Herbarium. You'll continue to find more great tours and other curiosities here on Flock. If you're enjoying the channel, plunk your cursor on that subscribe button and hit the notifications bell so you know when we release a new video. We'll see you in the next episode. Oh, it's the most wonderful time of the year.